Hey, g'day, it's Prezzo. Thanks for stopping by. Now, I haven't done a build video on this channel for over four weeks now. The previous two videos were to do with the 30,000 subscriber draw, uh, and I held a competition for that to give away some things. And since then, I've sent out the prize packs for second, third, and fourth prize. But the person that won the first prize pack is named Jason R, and I've not heard from him. Now, Jason, if you're watching, uh, you need to watch the previous video before this one. It has my email address on that video, and you can get in touch with me, and I can arrange to send you that prize pack. Now, if anybody watching knows Jason R, please tell him that he's won a prize, and I really want to get that sorted and then squared away. Now, if I don't hear from Jason by the time I publish the next video, I'll do a sort of a second chance draw. I'll just pick someone at random from that prize draw video, and I'll get the prize pack out to them. Now, what's today's video about? Well, I'm gonna bring you in for a closer look at the bench here, and we'll talk about what's happening. The next video I was gonna do on this channel was the build of the rear tool post for my Colchester student lathe. And I had all of that ready to go. I had the stock cut up, I'd made a prototype, I had the drawings, but in between, I thought I'll just quickly knock up a set of T-nuts and toe clamps for a pallet to go on my rotary table. So I've got a beautiful 10 inch rotary table. It was given to me by a good friend, but I don't have any mounting hardware to go onto that particular attachment. So these toe clamps are threaded for M8 hardware, and I'm gonna put a series of M8 threaded holes in this chunk of aluminum here. We'll also take eight, eight millimeter dowel pins, and these T-nuts are sized to suit the T-slots in that rotary table. So I've made four that'll take M12, uh, threaded hardware and four that will take eight and six millimeter threaded hardware. These need to be deburred and then they'll be parkerized so they get a nice rust free finish on them. But what went wrong? Well, I was making one of these, this is an early one, and I had these set up in a fixture to machine that 15 degree slope and the 15 degree edges here. And uh, what happened was I didn't secure the vise enough and I was doing a climb cut on this 15 degree slope here. It grabbed the part, pulled it into the cutter, and the rest, as they say, is hysterical. I mean, history. But yeah, it was a lot of uh, screaming and crying and kicking. Uh, and especially when I looked at my beautiful carbide end mill and realized that it was no longer a four flute end mill, it's now a three flute end mill. So it's completely fractured off one of the cutting edges here. But surprisingly, it kept working. I was able to finish off all of the rest of the cutting on those toe clamps, even with only three cutting edges. But I decided I should be able to re-grind this. Now I've got one of those D-bit grinders, like a Decal clone D-bit grinder, and I thought it was about time I learned how to do this properly. Now there's an excellent tutorial on YouTube. It's done on a channel called Projects Down Under. But the gentleman who did that has exactly the same D-bit grinder that I have and he's done a wonderful tutorial on how to sharpen two flute and four flute end mills and slot drills, and also how to grind the spiral edges, the flutes. So check out that video. I'll put a link in the description of this video, and also there's a link up above there now if you want to go and check that out. But it's probably one of the best ones that I've seen. So in the process of uh, learning how to do this, I ran into sort of a problem that I want to try and resolve in today's video. So let's have a close look at that. But in the meantime, this is going straight to the shelf of shame. Ugh, another fail. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you should be able to see a two-dimensional illustration of what's happening with the D-bit grinder as we're trying to sharpen this 12 millimeter end mill. And I've just simply laid out the most important parts of the D-bit grinder. So right down the bottom here, you can see this thing called the main rocking shaft. I don't know what it's really called. That's just the, the name I came up with. But this is the feature that the workhead will pivot on. And I've taken all the dimensions of uh, the D-bit grinder from my machine, and I've recreated this 2D drawing with those dimensions. So all the geometry should be more or less correct. So up the top here, you can see the diamond wheel and I've illustrated where the grinding surface of that wheel will be. In the centre here is just the, the locking hub which holds the wheel onto the spindle of the D-bit grinder. Now, let's take a closer look at what's happening at the wheel. 
So here is our 12 millimeter end mill and you can see the facets that need to be formed as we re-grind that particular tool bit. Now there are two levels shown here on this wheel. So over on the right hand side of this 2D illustration you can see that I've marked the cutter center when we've got the primary relief set at 12 degrees and then the cutter center when it's set at 5 degrees. And you'll notice that both of those elevations are above the center line of the wheel. Now of course these dimensions depend on how much stick out you have between the collet and the 12 millimeter end mill that I'm trying to grind here. And this is the wheel center itself so you can see that discrepancy in the heights. Now that actually works out as a good thing. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to rock that 12 millimeter cutter from the inside of the cup wheel uh, toward the outer edge of the cup wheel and that's where the grinding takes place on this particular facet here. So I'm just going to rotate this and we'll get it to about there and let's zoom in a bit and have another look. Now what you should be able to see here is that I haven't quite ground all of that facet yet. Let's just rock it a bit further. And what we're looking at here is the back of the uh, 12 millimeter cutter. And you can see now that I've got the, the actual center of the cutter right on the inside edge of that grinding surface. Now that's actually where you want to stop grinding. If you go any further, you're going to actually run into this edge here. So let's just take that a fraction further. Now what you've just done at that point is you've removed the cutting rake from this tooth and you've actually ground that cutting tooth so it's got a vertical face. Now that's going to work okay for brass but it's no good for aluminium, no good for steel. So like I said you need to be able to try and stop grinding right at that very point there where the center of the cutter is right over the inside edge of the grinding surface. And let's just zoom out again. So there's the geometry with the cutter at the point where you want it to stop. Now the same thing happens when you set it at the secondary relief angle of 5 degrees. You've got just the tiniest bit of clearance. Let's have another look. So you can see here that you've got this tiny amount of clearance, but you can't see what's going on when you're standing in the operating position on the machine. You really can't see where that vertical cutting edge is here and it's almost impossible to know where to stop. And that's exactly what I did when I was trying to sharpen this 12 millimeter cutter. I did all of the grinding, took it out, had a look at it, and realized that I'd actually ruined all four teeth on the end of the mill. So I want to come up with a way of being able to stop the grinding process repeatedly as you rotate the cutter around through 90 degrees each time to do all four teeth. And that is what I want to show you next. So let's have a look at the actual machine and I'll run you through what I want to achieve with that. In the tutorial that I saw from Projects Down Under, he was using exactly the same machine that I've got here. And his method for sharpening either a two flute or a four flute end mill was basically the same, except for the number of rotations as you grind the cutting edges. And the technique relied on setting this protractor here to about two degrees so that it's the very outside corner of the cutting edge that does the work. And for the primary relief, you set this, uh, this slide here or this rotation here to 12 degrees. And then you simply rotate the edge or the cutting lip 90 degrees each time for a four flute, uh, 180 degrees for a two flute. And with everything set up, uh, and like I say, go and watch his tutorial, it does the, the full process from start to finish. I'm just sort of recapping on what he did. But to apply the actual uh, grind on this uh, this edge that we've got presented to the wheel here, it's this knob here that you rotate. And what that does is it pivots the work head outboard. So you can bring that out until you reckon you've reached the center of the cutter and then sweep it back in again. Then you can release this and set round to the next angle uh, which would be 270 degrees and do the same again, sweep the, the wheel head out and back in again and so on. And you just keep doing that until you ground all four edges with the primary relief. You then loosen the screw here, bring the angle up to five degrees and you do the same again 
but for the uh, secondary relief, it's just a very, very fine grind. You, you just basically touch it and that's all. Now, the thing is, uh, like I said, it's really hard to get your head in there and see what's going on. And if you overdo this rotation of the wheel head, or the work head, sorry, and touch that edge that's sitting down here underneath at six o'clock position, you're going to ruin that cutting edge. So somehow or other, you've got to work out a way of stopping that before you go too far. So that's what I'm going to do in this video. I want to work out a way of actually fitting some sort of a sleeve or a collar or an indexing ring on this particular feed knob here so that we can bring it to a position, set a zero mark, and then repeat that process every time we rotate the cutter through 90 degrees. And when I looked at this, I couldn't understand why the manufacturers didn't consider that as an option. It didn't seem to be too hard to do. So what I'm going to do now is going to remove this uh, knob completely and we'll work out a way of actually fitting some sort of a sleeve on here which can be locked in position and then we need some sort of a zero mark on the machine here and uh, from then on it should be plain sailing. <laughs> That's all it is, uh, it's just uh, like a dog point on here. That thread there is 10 millimeters by 1 millimeter pitch and I don't have a tap or a die that size. So whatever I do here is gonna to have to rely on clamping on this body of the knob here. And you see that I've already started machining that. When I put this in the lathe, I realize that that uh, outer diameter there is nowhere near concentric with the axis of this screw. So it's going to need machining and we're gonna to have to bring it down to a, a nominal size so we can make a collar that fits over that. So let's head over to the lathe and have a look at that. I'm just going to put that uh, 10 millimeter thread in an ER32 collet. Don't need to clamp it too tight. Now, I don't know what this plastic is. It seems like some sort of a thermoset plastic, a bit like Bakelite. And it's certainly not accurate. It's obviously been molded over the threaded uh, fastener here. So let me just start this up and I'll show you how badly out of round it is. And like I said, I've already started machining the surface here just to see whether it was able to be machined. But I'm going to take that down to a smaller diameter and I'll face off the inside face of the knob as well. Whatever that is, it smells like some sort of phenolic resin. Certainly machines okay. I think I just ruined that. <laughs> Looks like there's a hex head in there that I've just clipped the edge of. So um, I may end up having to make a whole new knob here. But let's let's keep going. I'm going to just um, use this as it is and just see if the concept works. I think eventually I'll remake all of this assembly here in some sort of material like aluminium or brass or something. So you just see the edges of that steel hex showing through there and uh, it wouldn't take much to snap the, the, the bigger part off this collar here. But like I say, this is really just a proof of concept. If it works, I'll make something better. So with that knob modified now and having the parallel section which is truly concentric with the threaded section here, what I need to have was a sleeve that fitted over that section. Now I went ahead and made this pretty much off camera. It's just plain turning work. The uh, sleeve that I've got here is aluminium. It's 30 millimeters outside diameter. It's got a bore on the inside of 18 millimeters diameter and it's 31 millimeters long. Now there's a, an M6 threaded hole in there and in the bottom of that threaded hole I've got a piece of Teflon. Now it's about five millimeters thick and five millimeters diameter and it, that's a nice sort of snug fit in that threaded hole there. 
And if I can fit a socket head screw in there, I'd be able to put some clamping pressure on the Teflon pad and that will keep it sort of still, you know, I won't lock it completely tight. This reduced section here, this sort of counter bore, fits up against the face of the casting. So what we can do now is assemble that and we can move the sleeve radially and axially and that allows us to set this accurately. So we can wind this in here and by the way that thread is a really loose fit in the threaded hole here and I think if this works I'm going to remachine all of these parts to make it look like this uh, adjuster here. I can't understand why they went to so much trouble with this one, it's nicely made and this is just a piece of rubbish. Anyway, we can wind that in. Now, as you go in, you will feel some resistance. Now, at that point, the end of the threaded spindle is up against the lever on the inside of this casting. Now, if you continue to turn that clockwise, the whole work head over here starts to move outboard, away from the center of the grinding spindle. Now, the idea would be that you'd work out where you want the grind to stop, which is about there. I can sort of feel some resistance now as it's touching the inside of the wheel. You can then slide that sleeve in and rotate it and lock that grub screw. Now what I need on this sleeve is sort of a scribe mark or a zero mark and I need something on the face of the casting that it can register against. So the idea would be that with that all zeroed out what you can do then is to grind the first lip on the cutter and then withdraw that rotate the cutter around to the next uh, tip or next edge and then wind that back in again until it registers exactly between the two marks. Now that way you can get some repeatability and predictability with the way you're grinding the end of the cutter. So what I think I'll do now is I'm going to uh, drag engrave a zero mark on the aluminium sleeve and I'll laser cut something to go on the face of the casting here. We'll get that all set up and we'll see if it works. Just about ready to drag and grave the zero mark and it'll come out right on this edge here which is up against the casting of the machine. To set this up I just put a one two three block on top of the vise and I'll just check that that plug tap that's in that threaded hole at the moment is square or vertical and then I've used my uh, probe to find the edge against the back of the vise, the fixed jaw and I probed exactly half the diameter of that stock. So that'll give me the zero mark right in this back corner. All right, so let's give it a try. So there's our zero mark, it does raise a little burr, but the thing I like about drag engraving is it's nice and quiet, <laughs> there's no chance of snapping the tool bit, and uh, yeah, you always get nice results with it. Just about to laser cut and laser engrave these two plates here now. One of these is a drill jig, the other one is going to be the finished plate that goes on the casting of the DBIC grinder. So the one at the top here will have two and a half millimeter holes for tapping size for M3, the one at the bottom there has got the slotted hole so I can get a bit of adjustment when this one goes on permanently. Now all of the red lines are going to get cut right through, the blue lines are just going to be engraved and that's going to give me a black mark on the silver background. So let's go ahead and do those. I just uh, rested that little drill jig in place at the moment. Now what I need to do is to stick that onto the casting. I've got some double sided tape on the back of it 
and uh, it's you know it's going to have to look right. I want it to be parallel to the bench that the machine is sitting on. And unfortunately, this casting here has some draft angle on it. It's just a rough casting, so I can't run a square off this edge here or off this one. So I just put a one, two, three block on the bench. I can sit another block against it like that. And then I'm going to have to take the back off the double-sided tape and try and get that stuck on there. And that'll hold that long enough so I can run a drill bit through and just mark the casting and then I'll keep going and tap the holes. Now, this is going to get uh, awkward. Uh, I'm going to have to get down low so I can see what I'm doing. So uh, expect some squaring and cursing. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I've stopped covering up my manky looking uh, fingernail. I injured that probably about uh, two months ago. I was shifting some material in a cupboard and it just simply fell back onto that finger right there, right at the junction where the, the nail grows out. And at the time it didn't hurt much. I just sort of uh, said, oh, that hurt, you know. And then the next day it started bleeding underneath the, the nail and uh, it just totally delaminated and the nail came off. And for a while there I was covering it up. I thought maybe some people would get a bit uh, squeamish about it, but hey, <laughs> what can you do? Um, you're just going to have to live with it. So I'm just going to get the back off this tape here. All right, now I'm just kneeling down on the ground here. I'm going to try and position this against that one, two, three block. That's pretty good. So I've got some adjustment in the other part that I made. I can uh, slide it left and right and it's got a little bit of uh, clearance top and bottom so I can sort of maneuver that around and get it right later on. So I can take this out now and I'll uh, just pilot drill those holes and then we'll get the threads in there. Yeah, that's stuck on better than I thought. <laughs> I just have to do a bit more adjustment there. You've got to get your head down really low and, and look straight on at it to get the gap around the, the collar and this laser cut part correct. But the important thing is that we've got two zero marks now. So I can return that feed screw to that same mark every single time without guessing. And what that means is that I should be able to grind the, the four flutes on that end mill and get them very, very close to center. Now, the end mill that I broke was a center cutting end mill. Now, it, that's very hard to replicate in a home workshop with a four flute cutter. So I will end up having to relieve the center of the cutter slightly, and I've already practiced that. I used a diamond burr to do that. But let's go ahead now. I'm gonna set this up and we'll try grinding the four flutes and see how good it is. Just before I do re-grind this cutter, I just wanted to show you what the original problem was. So apart from the fact that I snapped off a, a flute, <laughs> this, uh, this little bright patch you can see here is where the, the flute or the cutting edge of that flute ran into the inside of the cup wheel. And that effectively took all the rake off that flute there. So that's the problem with trying to do it manually without having a, an accurate way of positioning the cutter against the wheel. And I'm going to have to grind down below that now to get back to the correct geometry for that flute and or in fact all of the surviving flutes. Now I don't know if, if I'm going to try to re-grind this flute completely. What I'll probably end up doing is just progressively grinding deeper and deeper as I re-sharpen it 
and that flute will eventually come back. Now I could cut the entire end off the end mill uh, with a diamond wheel of some sort, I don't have one, and then regrind from fresh. But at this stage, we just want to see if we can uh, get back to a position where we can regrind a four flute cutter accurately each time. I put the end mill in a 12 millimeter collet. I've got the collet locked and I've got it set to zero here on the indexing ring. And I've also tilted the work head back at 12 degrees to give me the primary relief. That's the first grind that we're going to do. Now I've also set the cutting edge of that flute as close to horizontal as I can get it by eye. Now as far as I know, there's no easy way to do this. You just got to visually set it. If you get it wrong by a couple of degrees either side, it doesn't matter too much to the cutting performance. But what we need to do now is to set our starting position for the first grind. So what I'm going to do is to rock the work head toward me. And then I'm going to run the whole work head back against the face of the wheel by, while I rotate that by hand. So these wheels have a lot of run out, this one does anyway. So when I can hear it just touching the wheel, I'm going to back it off slightly. So you can just hear that now. So it's going to back that off a fraction. So that's going to be our starting position. And what we need to do now is to bring the work head toward me again until the inside of the tooth that's facing downwards at six o'clock is just rubbing on the inside of the wheel. So let's come around a bit closer so we can see. So again, rotating this by hand, we're just going to rock the work head toward me. Okay, you can hear that just rubbing now, so I do need to back that off. This is the most important thing, as far as I can work out. We do not want any of those cutting edges to touch the inside of the wheel. So I'm just going to back that off probably, I don't know, like a tenth of a millimetre. So it's completely clear and it's not touching anything on the inside of the wheel. Okay, now this is where we set our zero on this gadget that I've just made. So let's come back and have a look at that. So without touching this black knob here or rotating it, I'm just going to rotate the sleeve, bring the two zero marks together, and then lock that screw. So that is going to give me my repeatable stop every time we rotate the cutter 90 degrees to grind the next tooth. I've just rigged up dust extraction on the front of this machine. It's a very, very much a temporary measure, but you're not supposed to grind carbide uh, with diamond wheel and breathe in the dust. So I'm going to try and catch some of it here. So what I'm going to do is I'll do a couple of cycles, go around say twice or three times, grinding the primary relief, trying to get rid of that damaged area on the cutting edges. And then I'll swap over to the secondary relief, we'll do that and we'll have a look. Now it's going to get noisy so I'm just going to do it and uh, we'll see how it goes.
So I brought this work head forward now to five degrees. And unfortunately, you've got to go through and do that setting process again, but it doesn't take too long. So what we need to do now is just take a very, very fine cut just to finish off the cutting edge of each flute. So I'm just going to bring this forward. And again, I just want to just brush that with the wheel. You can see it's just touching there now. So I'm going to back that off a fraction and we're just going to get sort of a very superficial grind on that edge. I just ran that whole process again. So I put it all back in there. I ran the primary relief and the secondary relief again. The first time I did it, I wasn't happy with how far I'd gone to the center of the cutter. There was a big lump left in the middle there. And this time, I uh, seemed to have got it okay. The, um, the actual secondary relief is not consistent. Some are wider than others. But I'm interested to see if this cuts. Now, the other important thing here is that we're not trying to recreate a center cutting end mill. This isn't going to do that. Uh, given that it's the very outside corners that are going to do the work, I'm happy that it will work. Uh, I'm not too worried that it's not consistent. And also I've noticed that uh, some of the uh, cutting edge is sort of ground away with negative rake or, pos or neutral rake, I should say. But remember, it's the outside corners that are going to do the work. So. I'm going to go and uh, relieve the center of this cutter. We'll have a look at that and then we'll put it in the mill and see if it does actually cut. Right at the very center of that cutter, you'll see there's a little like a pyramid, uh, which is the leftover material that didn't get ground. And the process I'm going to do now is called gashing. Now, what you would normally do is put something like a cutoff wheel and bisect the angle between two cutting edges and cu cut a slot basically across in two directions. Now I don't have anything like that, but what I am going to use is a diamond burr in a Dremel. So we're just going to grind away that little pyramid there and that should relieve the center and it should cut. So this is the diamond burr that I'm using. It's around about uh, what three millimeter diameter and it cuts carbide, no trouble at all. And I'm just going to lower this down a bit. And getting it started is the hardest part. Once you get a bit of a groove going, it's easy. But just getting that groove started is the hard part. So there's our little cross in the center there, which is the relief. Um, if I went deeper at this point, next time I sharpen, I may not need to do that again. Anyway, let's see if it cuts. Just got a random lump of aluminium in there and we'll do a sort of a moderate cut in that. And I've got this other material. This is a fairly hard steel. You can cut it with high speed steel, but it's better with carbide. Well, 
left a bit of a burr, raised a burr as a cut, but the bottom of that cut, the floor of the cut's very good. So that looks okay. Let's try it in the steel. Well again, uh, the finish in the bottom of that cut is very good and that's probably where you want to see that the cut is performing well. It doesn't raise as much of a burr on the steel, so um, I think that uh, that process has worked quite well. At least I've resurrected that cutter. It's now capable of doing useful work and the more I sharpen it, the more I'm going to recover that broken edge. So for what it's worth, I, you know, but the small amount of time I invested in making that, I think it's okay. Okay, let's wrap up. So just to summarize, I'm happy with the way this has turned out. It gives you a visual indication when you're grinding right to the very center of this style of cutter. So it's most useful on what would be a four flute center cutting end mill. Two flute slot drills are pretty straightforward with this machine, but these are a little bit more complicated. So this does give you that little bit of uh, confidence when you're trying to grind the style of cutter here. Now I'm not happy with the way it looks. This is just uh, like a prototype. I think I need to do something more like this one here. So I'll rebuild all of that and it'll have some knurling. It'll have a satin glass bead finish on it, some clear anodizing. And I need to do a better job of marking that zero point on there. This is, uh, I actually polished that a bit and it's pretty much removed it. So I'll do a better job with that next time. Even just a, like a, a small dimple in there would be suitable. So that's, yeah, that's gonna get rebuilt. Uh, but the quality of cut that I got on the aluminium there, it created a lot of burrs, but the floor of the cut's quite good. I think that style of cutter is more suitable for steel and harder materials. Uh, just ordinary high-speed steel would work better on aluminium, I think. But on the steel, I'm super happy with that. Now, I didn't do anything to that, came straight off the mill and there's almost no burring on the edges and the floor of that cut is, well, it's as good as what I would have thought was a brand new cutter. So given that this was pretty much scrap, uh, I think I've done a fairly good job at recovering that and as I grind it more and more, I'll get more of this corner back again, the one that got chipped off completely. So, yeah, happy with it, uh, but it can look a lot better and I need more practice too. Uh, I think I'll uh, you know, work through a few of the other cutters that I got that are a bit blunt using this and uh, I'll see if I can get a, a more reliable technique. So that's it guys, uh, thanks for watching today and uh, join me for the next video. We're gonna do the, the rear tool post build for the Colchester student lathe. Uh, oh, and Jason, ah, get in touch, will you? I wanna give that prize away. Okay, it's Prezzo signing out for now. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers.